With a thorough understanding of entropy under our belts, let's now bring the second law of thermodynamics into greater focus. We've seen that when we consider the system and the surroundings for spontaneous processes within a system, we notice that energy dispersal, or increasing disorder, is universal. One example of this that we've seen already is the idea of two ideal gases separated by a partition, the picture of which you see in the bottom left of the slide. When we remove that partition, the two gases spontaneously mix, and we've noticed that there's an increase in the entropy of the system associated with that. I want to give one more instructive example of a positive entropy change in a spontaneous process within an isolated system that uses the classic definition of entropy. So let's imagine that we had an isolated system whose boundaries I'll denote with this black box. No transfer of matter or energy in or out is possible within this box. And let's imagine that we had two boxes within that had almost the same dimensions as the system itself, but we had, say, one block at a temperature T1 and another block with the same mass, same volume, made of the same material and all that good stuff with a temperature of T2. So the two blocks are identical in every way, it's just that the T2 block is somewhat hotter than the T1 block, and in fact, Imagine that it's infinitesimally hotter, so the difference in temperature between T1 and T2 is very, very, very small. Now the two are in contact in the middle of the system. What that means is heat can flow from the hotter body to the colder body. We know from personal experience, in fact, that heat is going to flow spontaneously from the hotter body to the colder body. And if the temperature difference is very, very small, then we can imagine an infinitesimal amount of heat, del Q, flowing from the T2 block to the T1 block. What's the total entropy change associated with this process? Well, since we're dealing with an isolated system in the overall black box, we can imagine T1, say, as the system, and T2 as the surroundings. And so we can write delta S for T1 plus delta S for T2 must be equal to the total entropy change, which I'll just write as delta S. Since this is an infinitesimal process that we're imagining, let's ch convert these to Ds. So ds t1, a very small change in entropy within t1, plus ds for t2, a very small entropy change in the t2 block, is equal to the total infinitesimal change in energy, ds. Now what are each of these in this process? Well, remember the classical definition of an infinitesimal entropy change. ds is equal to del Q rev, very tiny reversible heat, divided by the temperature at which that heat transfer occurs. Since we're dealing with infinitesimal differences here, then we can imagine this heat transfer as happening reversibly, and we can replace each term with a del Q divided by T term. Since heat is flowing into the colder block, we represent del Q as positive del Q divided by T1 in this case. And since heat is flowing out of T2, well, the entropy change here is negative del Q divided by T2. It may look at first glance like this difference is going to come out to be zero. But remember, T2 is infinitesimally bigger than T1. That means what we're looking at here is a difference between a larger term and a smaller term. What does that mean? Well, that means that ds must be greater than zero. For heat to flow, there must be at least an infinitesimal difference in temperature between the two blocks. What this example shows us is that difference in temperature is associated with a positive entropy change when heat flows from the hotter block to the colder block. We're going to see this idea again very soon, but one thing I want you to notice for this process is that the change in entropy, the total change in entropy, is greater than zero. This will turn out to be the fundamental criterion for all spontaneous processes, that within an isolated system, entropy can only increase in spontaneous processes. But another way to think about this qualitatively is that the energy that is in a sense concentrated in T2 is becoming dispersed in T1 as the heat transfer occurs. More generally, a concentration of energy in one place, be it system or surroundings, must be more than balanced by a dispersal of energy somewhere else. That's what leads us to this idea that ds, or delta s, must be greater than zero. The dispersal of energy more than counterbalances the concentration of energy. And this is one statement of the second law of thermodynamics.
Here it is in a more mathematical form using deltas rather than d's. Here, remember, the universe is an isolated system. And just as we saw for the isolated system with the hot and cold blocks, the change in entropy for the universe for any spontaneous process must be greater than or equal to zero. When we're thinking about the universe, we're thinking about a system and a surroundings. But ju as we just saw, we can subdivide any isolated system into system and surroundings and come to the same conclusion. Another way of thinking about this is that if the system becomes more ordered, the surroundings must become more disordered and vice versa. There are many different ways to think about the second law, and another statement uses Boltzmann's definition of entropy, the idea that S is proportional to the natural log of W, the number of distinct microstates associated with a given macrostate. In Boltzmann's eyes, a greater W means more ways to physically prepare a particular microstate. That means that that macrostate is simply more likely to exist. Probabilistically, a state with greater s has a greater probability of existing. In this sense, the second law seems fairly natural then. Over time, the most likely macrostate, the one with the highest w, the most microstates associated with it, is going to come to dominate. This is provided no constraints exist, like the partition barring the red and blue gases from intermixing with each other. But this word tend is very important. In Boltzmann's eyes, this is a tendency and not a hard and fast law. We can imagine, for example, that there is some chance, provided no energy change occurs, a very low entropy state might come to exist spontaneously. For example, in a container of ideal gas, since the gas particles don't interact with each other, there is a situation where all the gas particles are, say, concentrated in one corner of the container, and this is a hypothetical state that the gas could assume, and if we looked at it for long enough, we would eventually see that state. However, we're used to the idea that, for the most part, gas particles spread themselves out over the entire volume of the container. This is the highest S situation, which will tend to dominate over time. And in particular, if you look at how W changes as we spread out the particles, W becomes much, much, much greater as we move from the concentrated situation to the as dilute as possible situation. This gas on the right has a much, much higher W than the situation on the left. Here's an example of this idea in graphical form. If we start with a system that has, say, eight particles in the lowest energy state, over time the particles will tend to spread themselves out over the different energy levels. This statement of the second law and the classical statement that we just saw both reflect the idea that the entropy of the universe is tending to a maximum which was a sentiment expressed by Clausius. He noticed that within isolated systems, such as the universe, entropy tends to increase until it reaches a maximum, at which point the system is in a state called equilibrium. We'll have much, much more to say about equilibrium in a future series of videos. Finally, I want to revisit the idea of reversible and irreversible processes, which we looked at briefly in the introduction when we looked at reversible and irreversible compression of an ideal gas. As we've just seen, the second law states that for physically allowed processes, the entropy of the universe must either stay constant, delta s or ds equals zero, or increase, delta s or ds is greater than zero. But for a particular process occurring within the universe, if delta s of the universe is greater than zero for, say, the process of converting a to b within a system, what must be true for the reverse process, b to a? We can imagine this has very practical implications for chemistry. If the reaction A to B has delta S of the universe greater than zero, then what must be true for the reverse reaction B to A? Well, if delta S of the universe is greater than zero for A to B, such that it's allowed by the second law of thermodynamics, then B to A must be physically impossible because it has delta S less than zero for the entire universe. It decreases the entropy of the universe. That means that the reverse process cannot occur. That's where the terminology irreversible comes from. It is not possible to run the process B to A, leaving the universe in the exact same state it was in, for example, before the forward process, A to B. Note that this doesn't mean that we can't run the reverse reaction B to A at all. It means that we can't run the reverse reaction within a system and leave the surroundings in the same state they were in before that reaction took place. And life is full of processes like this. For example, 
your phone's battery discharges as you use it. You plug the phone in to recharge it. Now this looks like a reversible process, right? Since you start with a full battery, you use up the battery until it's empty, and then you recharge it. How is the second step of this process, the recharging step, not just the exact reverse of the discharging step? Well, although the battery returns to 100%, in the course of this process, there is heat dissipated to the surroundings. And so the surroundings are not the same as they were, in fact, back here at the original state. Heat has been transferred to the surroundings, and so entropy increases overall. Even if delta S for this overall discharging and recharging process is zero, this is delta S for the system. Delta S for the surroundings must necessarily be greater than zero because heat is transferred out to the surroundings. This is the essence of the second law. All physically allowed cyclic processes like this involve a transfer of heat to the surroundings. Ds, or delta S, is greater than zero. You'll sometimes hear this referred to as a heat tax. The idea that even for cyclic processes within a system, the surroundings, or the universe, kind of takes a heat tax from the process. It takes a cut of the work we put in to engage in a cyclic process. The only processes that are truly reversible have delta S for the universe of zero and an infinitesimal entropy change of zero as well. You think about the only processes really that can do this are those that basically amount to no change at all, especially when we think about the macroscopic perspective of thermodynamics. For example, the infinitesimally small particles of an ideal gas buzzing around inside an isolated container, all of those movements, according to Newton's laws, amount to delta S equals zero and dS equals zero. Just to look one more time at the reversible and irreversible processes that we've seen already, when we compress a gas rapidly on mass like this, this was path one, this is an irreversible compression. Note that because we're compressing the system, delta S for the ideal gas system is less than zero. However, delta S for the surroundings, because the process releases heat, must be greater than zero. And in fact, the magnitude of delta S sur must be greater than delta S cis, such that overall, delta S for the universe is greater than zero. And this is the hallmark of irreversible processes. They have entropy changes of the universe that are greater than zero. For reversible processes, like using our infinitesimally small grains of sand, in fact, ds or delta s for the universe is equal to zero. At each point, we do in fact cause a decrease in the entropy of the system. However, that's exactly counterbalanced by an infinitesimal increase in the entropy of the surroundings. Remember, there's a little bit of heat, del q, that's transferred out to the surroundings with the addition of each infinitesimally small grain of sand. That's associated with a positive entropy change ds of the surroundings, and the sum of these two adds up to zero. And so we do these infinitesimal additions of infinitely tiny grains of sand over and over and over again, and what we find ultimately is that delta s for the universe is equal to zero. Now, of course, this is not a physically allowed situation. For this to be able to occur physically, the grains of sand would have to have infinitely small mass, which of course is impossible. But this does give us insight into the fact that if we do try to approximate reversibility using very, very tiny changes, a large number of very, very tiny changes, we can actually get very close to an entropy change of zero, which has advantages because that means that, for example, the universe is taking as small of a heat tax from us as possible as we conduct this process.